Welcome to the Lutheran History Podcast, where we cover over 500 years of Lutheran history. Our guest today is Dr. Robert Kolb, who is a professor emeritus of systematic theology at Concordia Lutheran Seminary in St. Louis. He received his master's degree and master of sacred theology from Concordia. He also earned a master of arts and doctor of philosophy degree from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. He's also received several honorary degrees as well. Dr. Kolb retired in 2009 after 16 years of distinguished service as a missions professor of systematic theology at Concordia Lutheran Seminary. Before joining the seminary, he had served as director of the Center for Reformation Research and in various teaching roles in religion and history departments at Concordia College, St. Paul, Minnesota. He's taken much time over many years to teach abroad. He's also been involved in several boards, including uh, serving both officially on behalf of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod on Commissions and as a leader of 16th century and Reformation societies. There's certainly not enough time to list everything he has written, but I included a selection today. He is the author of several books, including uh, Christian Faith, a Lutheran Exposition, The Genius of Luther's Theology, a Wittenberg Way of Thinking for the Contemporary Church. Uh, studies of the Interpretation of Holy Scripture in the 16th and 17th Century, Lutheran Ecclesiastical Culture, 1550 to 1675, Bound Choice Election and Wittenberg Theological Method from Martin Luther to the Formula of Concord, Sources and Context of the Book of Concord, Concord which he co-edited with James Nestigan, and Teaching God's Children His Teaching, a guide to study to the study of Luther's Catechism. And the list can go on and on. Perhaps where his name is most seen on Lutheran bookshelves today is on the Book of Concord itself. He was one of the directors and translators for this most used English edition today. He's also written more than 100 articles and collections of essays. One of the most recent articles is titled Wittenberg Uses of Law and Gospel, which was just published in the fall edition of the 2023 Lutheran Quarterly. And that is the focus for today's podcast episode. So with no more uh, details than that, I'd like to welcome you, Dr. Kolb. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Lutheran History Podcast. Thank you very much, Ben. It's great to be with you. And I should also add, I've had uh, Dr. Kolb uh, in two classes now in my reduced residency program, so I've had the pleasure uh, of learning uh, from him in person. So I'm happy to have this chance to talk some more because I don't have any more classes with you in my <laughs> in my schedule. So this is a good little catch up for me as well. All right. So our, the first thing I want to ask you about today, uh, because you have done so much uh, work, I, you know, it seems like your life has been dedicated to a historical theology, is just this question. What can you tell us about the value and importance of historical theology? We are, um, we're all concerned about our memories. Uh, as I get older, that seems to be an increasing concern. <clears throat> um but our whole personalities are really formed on the basis of what we remember from our childhood, from our youth, um, and from our experience throughout the years. And so I think it's important for the church also to have a sense of memory of, of where the Holy Spirit has been working in the past and what uh, the work of the Holy Spirit has uh, done in sustaining the church and building the church and spreading the church for, uh, for now 2,000 years. And so th there's no situation in history, I think, that's exactly like another situation. But there are there are similarities in the way that uh, the world works and the way the church works. And so we can learn a lot from uh, reflecting on uh, both the grace of God as we see it in, in um, human history in general and in the history of the church in particular. Um, and we can also um, be inspired uh, to... Uh, Trust that the Holy Spirit's at work, even when we don't understand always what He's doing with the church, and uh, and and get get some tips on on how to uh, address problems that, even though they may not be exactly the same, uh, have parallels in the history of the church. All right, thank you for that that insight. Now, specifically onto our topic today, what led you to research and write on? the use of law and gospel in Wittenberg? Well, some 50 years ago, uh, when the Missouri Synod was really being torn by controversy, one of the issues was the third use of the law. And um, although I've had uh, very close friends 
who have reacted to uh, pietistic influences that really do turn some Lutherans in on, on an evaluation of their own performance when they should be looking to the cross and, and the empty tomb. Uh, so I, I'm sympathetic with those who said there are really only two uses, and we learn what we should be doing from the accusing force of the law and the curbing force of the law. <clears throat> but um, that, And that controversy really hasn't gone away uh, within our own circles and in broader uh, Lutheran and Protestant circles, I would say. Uh, and so I've I've always uh, had that question sort of on my mind. And then an invitation came to speak to a pastoral conference on uh, on the uses of the law. And so I thought I would use that as the occasion to take another look at, at exactly what the 16th century texts have to say. And frankly, I was surprised um, when I discovered that uh, well, I posed the question, uh, how many uses of the law did Luther really have? And um, found that the answer is actually none. He doesn't use the term. I, th that's not literally true. I think I found two instances, and there probably are a few more. But the concept of use of the law was um, was present in, in some medieval theologians, but it hadn't become a doctrinal uh, category that Luther was used to working with. Uh, and so uh, that brought me kind of back to ground zero. And I had to start thinking about questions like, well, what did Luther do with the law then? Yeah, could you please go into then, uh, how did Luther use the law and, and, and take as much time please as you like, because this is kind of the heart of the, you know, uh, of the topic today. Okay. Um, I had always taught that Luther had uh, explicitly in the small called articles of 1537, he had two uses of the law, the uh, societal use or the political use, which um, has a positive effect on people because it, it brings order to society. It makes us behave. It operates with, with um, a system of rewards and punishments, and that, that makes society um, pleasant. Luther also says in the small cult articles that um, what actually happens is sometimes um, the, this first use of the law will, um, will arouse resistance, what I like to call the, the terrible twos of the Christian life, where uh, people hear God's law and say, I'm going to assert my own identity and, and, and not follow the law, do the opposite, perhaps. Uh, and another negative effect is that uh, what is given to us for uh, ordering our lives on this earth uh, is sometimes taken uh, to heaven and presented to God as a reason why he should like us. And uh, so that uh, that tendency for the law also to make us works righteous um, was one of the things that Luther noted as 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 a, a part of the uh, the work that the first use of the law does. And then the second use, the theological use, uh, is that which which nails us as sinners. Um, Philip Melanchthon said the law is always accusing us. Uh, it's always pointing out that we have failed to be uh, the people that uh, God created us to be uh, in Eden. And so, uh, so those two uses, uh, Luther uh, specifically talks about, but he doesn't call them uses. He talks about their um, function and about their uh, power. And that got me to thinking, um, what's the difference? <clears throat> and um, so when I was translating the, the formula of Concord for the 2000 translation of the Book of Concord, uh, the traditional title for Article 6 had been on the third use of the law. That was Melanchthon's language, and that's that's the issue that needed to be addressed because of controversies in the, in the 1560s uh, and 70s. Uh, but the previous translator of the Tappert edition, 1959 it was published, Arthur Carl Peepcorn, who incidentally also uh, shared this office or had this office uh, uh, when I was a student, 
but uh, uh, Dr. Peepcorn had translated the the third function of the law. Well, I wanted to look brilliant, and so I thought, well, I'll find my own word and thought about the third impact of the law. Although I, I really liked function and was about ready to go with that. But if you open the the translation, you'll find it says third use of the law. Why did I go back to the third use of the law? Because that's what the German says, and a good translation tries to follow what, what the original text says. Um, and as I was thinking about that in the light of this small called articles uh, talk about function and power, uh, it occurred to me that you and I may use the law um, in its third use to instruct its instructional use. We may just want to inform our, uh, other people, other Christians, what a God-pleasing life looks like. Uh, my example is that you're giving the best uh, instruction ever given in your community on on the wonderful gift of of sexuality and, and how uh, God wants us to to use this gift properly to a, a confirmation class and and it's just such a positive presentation and uh, one of the one of the pupil students uh, runs from the room crying and 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 uh, obviously struck by what you thought was good instruction, but it has turned into either accusation or pointing out that that person has been abused and uh, and parent or or relative or someone has uh, has broken God's law. Uh, and then I realized that the, the function in my mind when the law is given to me in whatever use um, is going to make an impact on the way I live. It may cause me to run away. It may cause me to, um, as as Luther says in the small cult articles, rebel against God more strongly, uh, or it may have the impact of making me more works righteous. Uh, and so the the brunt of the article that you mentioned is is my trying to work out this distinction of our use as witnesses to God's law from its function in the minds of our hearers and then the impact it makes on on their lives. All right. So <clears throat> you got to divide divide it basically, and and how is it? What's what's the goal of the word itself versus how it's received? Is that yeah what yeah. you're getting at? And, yeah. And we're we're not always sensitive enough to listen to how it's functioning and what and noticing what the impacts are. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll go go off this pastoral tangent. That's always hard when you're preaching to a room of more than one person in it, right? Yes. <laughs> you can't yeah. even well, even one person's hard enough. How is this going to be received, right? Is right. is yeah. the issue, right? And that's you know, that's where a lot of this conversation goes into. Um, but I'm curious though, could you get just share some of the details of like how did Luther speak? How did he talk about any of those things? You know, it's the intention of the law. What did God why does God have the law? Is it uh a natural thing or is it just kind of an accidental thing or you know all that all that stuff i'd be very interested in hearing more on well luther believed very much that uh, god had had uh, as creator had designed human life in a specific way and so that that design is reflected in the law and so the uh, hymn that we sing by um, matthias loy a 19th century lutheran theologian uh, the law of God is always good, uh, reflects exactly what Luther thought. It's our sinful reaction to it that that is bad, that uh, earns us the accusation and condemnation of the law. So um, the law was not given as a means of salvation. Adam and Eve didn't have to uh, serve a, a period of probation in Eden before uh, before they got the title human. They were created as God's children, human creatures as God wanted us to be. But, but the law then came in um, as sin made it necessary to have an explicit guide for what Adam and Eve just uh, understood as, as the way we are. And so the law does describe the way we should be, the way um, God designed the good human life. And in that regard, uh, when it functions as a guide, it uh, 
moves us toward uh, living a good life on the basis of our trusting in God. Um, the, the problem is, of course, that we have turned away from our God and don't we don't want to let uh, his word be the point of orientation. Luther thought that the original sin in Eden was doubt of the word of God, uh, defiance of our creator. And, uh, and Luther thought then that that original sin greets us every day um, when we awake and um, are not fearing, loving, and trusting in God above all things. And so Luther did try to instruct the people, and he instructed them negatively by saying, don't do this. But he also instructed them positively, saying, this is, this is the will of the Lord for your lives, that you care for one another, that uh, you respect authority, that you live responsibly with your neighbors and the like. Um, but Luther also saw that uh, the the stronger your faith is, the more you're going to want to trust God that you're you're his righteous child and, and obey him. And as you turn to the law for instruction in how to uh, live the good life that he designed for us, you're going to recognize that that law is still accusing you. It's still crushing you uh, because in the past you haven't. And in the present, you're not sure you really want to. Um, serve him in 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 complete and full obedience yeah and i had you know if i had this conversation with with people um, you know lay people who would seem to have the impression that well really the only law the really only commandment in eden was the fruit law you know don't don't eat this fruit don't don't touch that um mm -hmm. <clears throat> and i think i think that that maybe comes comes into play here when Luther talks about the law, as, as you laid it out, um, it is that the language of returning or recreating or or even restoring, right? And, and, I, and I think you made it pretty clear that to Luther, he was saying, this is just showing you what, in a way, your identity. We And I think we very often think of our identity in the terms of the gospel, which is obviously necessary, Um but in a way, he's saying it comes full circle. He, that law also shows you the the goal of what God created you to be. Yeah, I think the the Germans didn't have a word for identity exactly, and as it's not the exact equivalent of our concept of identity today. <clears throat> Excuse me, but um. But I think the word righteousness comes fairly close. If a person is righteous, we are what we're supposed to be, what God designed us to be, um, what God's righteousness is, his being, uh, what he really is, and uh, who he really is. Uh, and so uh, Luther uh, talked about um, a twofold identity or a twofold righteousness or two kinds of righteousness is the way that Luther's works translates it. Um, and the, the two kinds of righteousness are, are he, he uses uh, various terms, but but basically uh, we can use the terms active and passive. And our core identity, sort of our DNA, the, the identity we receive from our parents that can't be changed, uh, is our passive righteousness. And that comes to us when God forgives our sins and promises to be our God and, and promises that we will be his children. In, in baptism or whatever form of the word of the gospel we we encounter it um and, and so that core identity um does come from the gospel but that core identity means that um it, that's not one half of our life and, and active righteousness the other half it's a twofold righteousness it's a united person that we are and so because we trust in god we uh we want to act like his children. And so we have all kinds of secondary identities. Um, Luther worked with the medieval social theory that our lives are, or our society is divided into um, people in the household, which included family life and um, economic life, and then societal or political life and religious life, the congregation. And uh, so Luther saw these these. He doesn't use the term secondary identities, but he talks about them in, in such a way 
of when he describes our callings to um, to be parents and spouses and uh, to be shoemakers and and physicians and and to be uh, citizens or or rulers and to be uh, leaders in the church, lay people uh, witnessing and worshiping. Uh, so so Luther does have a a, a rather full sense of um, that our righteousness or our identity. And the two really can't be separated. Um, truly God-pleasing works flow from faith, uh, but faith um, simply wants to accept what, what God gives um, as, as a free gift of new life and then live that new life. Uh, so you're right, that they're, they're just inseparable for, for Luther. Yeah, from my limited uh, exposure and study, it, it seems to be really hard to properly understand Luther if there's you don't understand vocation to some degree. That's it, true, yeah. Yeah, so uh, going a little out of order of what I previously planned to talk about, I, I think this ties into, though, the section where you go into his use of the word shuld. Um, can, can you uh, define that term and explain where does it pop up? Uh, what does it mean? Because I think, I think that really gets into... Uh, what he's talking about with law and vocation. Uh, I've actually used the word for many, many years uh, now um, when I've read and, and spoken German. Uh, but it's only recently uh, occurred to me how how deeply significant the, we might say, two sides of the word from, from the standpoint of an English speaker, uh, the word schuld is. It, it means guilt. But it also means obligation. So Luther can even talk about God's schuld over and against his human creatures because God has promised. And when someone promises, he um, has an obligation to uh, deliver on the promise. <clears throat> and, um, and Luther picks up on this so that... Uh, he uses the term as it was used by many. Uh, it was the common usage of the time. He picks up on this sense of obligation to say uh, that when when we have not fulfilled our obligations, there is this burden of guilt. And so uh, the obligation and guilt are two sides of the same coin. The obligation is there simply because of who we are. And the guilt is there when we don't live up to a uh, to being the person that God created us to be. Uh, and so uh, the, the concept of guilt is very important because it, it is what really separates us from God. I was a little surprised as I reflected on, on Luther's sermons. I've done a, a much more work on Luther's sermons in the last 10 years than I had earlier. Um, in his sermons, he he talks some about guilt, but not a whole lot. He talks much more uh, as he's presenting the law of God about fear. Now, one of the things we're afraid of is the wrath of God, and, and why is God angry with us? Because of our guilt. So indirectly, he's talking about that. But when he's addressing our emotional state, he's, he's dealing with guilt as fear. And so in North America today, I think we tend to think, um, we're not all that guilty. We're, we live a pretty outwardly good life, at least. And so we don't really have a big problem with guilt. Um, but Luther's sense of the obligations we have goes much deeper than just a, a superficial look at our outward behavior. It goes to the very depths of our, our intentions, our, our thinking, our way of looking at the world. Um, and, and so uh, what he's talking about is whatever makes you uneasy, whatever takes your peace of mind away, um, whatever it is that that actually separates you from God is the problem that we're discussing this morning. And the problem we're discussing this morning can be solved only by going to the cross of Christ, only by um, feeling the breeze that that blows from heaven through the through the empty tomb into our lives and gives us uh, the resurrected life that Christ won for us. And so it, what I've just said shows how interwoven a sense of law and gospel 
um, is for Luther with all human emotions, um, fear, love, trust, fear in the sense of awe and respect and fear in the sense of being uh, being frightened. So uh, so Luther really is is viewing us as as whole people, um, sinners and saints at the same time. Yeah, you know, there might be in some cases a, a tendency when we talk about making a distinction between law and gospel, uh, and this is something I, I had fallen into, I, I think, too, even as a student, um, of trying to separate them <laughs> to the degree that they're they're sitting like two at different ends of the table, yeah, and that's not really how it works, especially not not for Luther. You can't, you don't just dissect it and and divide it to different parts and and leave them not touch each other right because they really do um they do work together uh, the the law tells us what the problem is the gospel gives us the solution and then in the solution um we as we live out that solution of being god's people again uh, we're still we're still bothered by sinful ignorance and and sinful wills and uh so we need that instruction uh, that that will turn to accusation, uh, but also we we need to be told, uh, especially in in our kind of society where there is where there are an absence of moral guidance in the public square, um, we really need that instruction very badly. Yeah, I, I think you had mentioned it in our uh, Luther's justification <laughs> class. It was a good illustration. I think we're not living in the Leave It to Beaver. <laughs> world anymore right <laughs> yes uh, where you yeah. can just have the public uh consciousness or, or taboos or whatever kind of serve that that guide or instruction or whatever you know use you want to label you want to put on it no one else is doing that it, and maybe no one else was really meant to be doing that but we got used to it that way well i think it a, an orderly society is in the interests of, of everyone right um and i think we don't really fully realize what we're doing to ourselves um, by not um, by not uh, enforcing some some standards for decent uh, societal behavior. I mean, the the threats that you hear from politicians against one another um, are just just unthinkable. Uh, in in the Leave It to Beaver, Dwight D. Eisenhower as president uh, era in which I grew up. <clears throat> yeah i'm I'm trying to think if i'm yeah yeah i want to move move on past this oh i guess maybe i want to ask you know just some of our listeners aren't uh they're they're uh, armchair theologians or they're you know casually interested in history um but i think where, where can this connect with everyone maybe back to the word, word uh shuld um as a, a guilt or a debt or obligation where will pretty much every lutheran have encountered this word in the catechism where does that pop up uh, as Luther uses it? Well, I, the, the, one of the most interesting uses is in the first article, where we are schuldig, we are, we are obligated simply by our nature. He created mm -hmm. us to thank and praise, to serve and obey him. And so um, that phrase shows the, the positive use, uh, that this is the intention, this is the, the design um, for our humanity. Um, and then in the second article, uh, the uh, those who haven't fulfilled their obligation and who are schuldig in that, that guilty sense are uh, uh, have announced to them that um, Christ died for their sin. He shed his blood, uh, not with a gold and silver kind of commercial uh, payment, but the payment of the soldier on the battlefield who who satisfied the judgment of, of uh, God's law that every sinner must die, uh, according to Romans 6.23. And so you, you really move from this positive sense of obligation to, um, to the atoning work of Christ. And then in, in the third article of the creed, you develop um, the, the sense of the Holy Spirit's action to bring us the forgiveness of sins that that ends up in life everlasting 
Yeah. And, and maybe I'm, I'm mis adding it in where it doesn't belong, but in the second article too, you know, he's redeemed me. Yeah. Um, all that. So now I ought to, to serve and obey him. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and so kind of like a, a feudal, a feudal sense. Right. And I think, you know, Luther was yeah. much closer to the that concept of the idea of atone, well, not atonement, but redemption. Uh, I was a slave to this, but now I, I, he owns me. I belong to him. There's just kind of a, this is just the way it is. It's natural, a natural obligation. And yeah. I think that's hard to get across to most people in America that you have a natural obligation. You don't have a right to be free from something, but you're naturally bound or tied yes. to something. Yeah. Which is, is true freedom. But I think that's something we miss also in the, the translation of the second article. Um, he has purchased and won me, but the word um, erworben that we translate purchased um, means purchased, but it, it has a much fuller sense in to simply take possession of. And he, he takes possession of us um, so that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. So um, th th that all does tie together beautifully in that way. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's get back to the, the overarching question. Well, I guess the subtitle for this could be, did Luther have a third use of the law, which is kind of the, the itching question, <laughs> right? People wanted. Um, and, and, yeah. you, and you said already, well, he doesn't really use the word use. Um, yeah. Anything else that you want to say uh, about how, for Luther, what the law is and what it does before we get into uh, <clears throat> Melanchthon and, and others? Yeah. Well, I think we could say the, a rose by any other name is still a rose, and the law by any other name is still a law. Uh, the gospel talks about what God does for us, and the law talks about what he expects uh, us to do as, as human creatures. And so I think what Luther would say is, um, as Christians, when we're sharing God's law with other people, whether it be parents with their children or neighbors in conversation or, or pastors from the pulpit, um, we are we're talking about human action and uh, what God expects us to be doing. And we're, we're not talking about the Holy Spirit's empowering us yet. We're simply talking about um, my reaction to what I have done or what I plan to do. And... Uh, in that, then, uh, we see this obligation of God, uh, and we will react to it. The function that it um, uh, that it performs in us and arouses some impact or another, that that function is simply to describe what God expects and help us compare our own lives to it. And in some cases, we will say. That clarifies what I'm supposed to do. I'm so thankful. Um, in other instances, we will have to admit that we failed in our obligation uh, as God's creatures, and we will recognize our guilt, <clears throat> or we will recognize that um, maybe to our shame, maybe simply um, in a terrifying way, uh, the abuse of other people, the, the disobedience of other people against God's commands have have cheapened and and uh, damaged our sense of the fullness of life God can give. And in the midst of, of, of that kind of abuse or that kind of victimization, we also flee um, to the gospel to have our, our worth um, reaffirmed by the love of God in Jesus Christ. Uh, and so the lie... Those who speak the law need to be somewhat clear on what they intend to do. That will just help us present the law more clearly. But we also have to recognize that uh, human life is bigger than just our intentions and that uh, other people may hear it, um, um, do a different thing than we intended to, the, to their own consciousness, and then what it does to their consciousness will determine how they act in in varying ways and uh so the i think luther would say uh, there are you use i think luther would say without numbering them uh, you use the law to get the kids in line you use the law to help the the kids 
repent. You use the law to help the kids understand what human life is really all about. And uh, in all those cases, you can separate the way you intend to use the law, what, what you intend it to do. But the law is going to do its own thing. The Holy Spirit is going to use the law um, and not always in line with with uh, preacher's intention. Um, and so um, so he he didn't tell the people today, I'm going to talk about the third use of the law. He just told them the way they were behaving in the marketplace was was not Christian and they should repent and presumed that that when they repented, they would act properly in the in the marketplace, or he told them specifically what they should be doing um, with God's material gifts for them, and knew that some of them were going to go um, home feeling feeling guilty, while others were going to say, "Oh, that's a really good idea. I can can spend my money or or uh, use my shoemaking ability in that way." Um, and so, I think Luther simply uses the law and leaves leaves to the Holy Spirit the way it's going to function and its its impact on people. Yeah, so I guess that brings a, a follow-up question. Since he is very, I mean, Luther is very uh, aware and self-conscious of how guilt and, and the, the burden on a conscience is, you know, that's his own personal, that's how he gets here, right? Uh, through yeah. the monastic system and, and all that. Um, did he do anything then uh, knowing I'm preaching and maybe received differently, uh, did he do anything to? I don't use too basic of a word, but to, to to fix it or to guard human consciences in case he maybe had a certain intention or he thought this was very clear how I even framed it, and yet it might possibly go the other way. I I I, I would say that as I've read his sermons particularly, but also his lectures to his students. He did know why he was using it, uh, how he was using it, the point he wanted to make in this particular instance. Um, but I think he also realized that um, it was going to hit different people in different ways. And uh, so he's he's always returning to the gospel. Some of his sermons are heavily law and little gospel. Some are, are heavily gospel with not very much instruction or a call to repentance. But he's always got uh, over a, a period of time when he's preaching, say, uh, a weekly series on John or Matthew, or um, sometimes he he didn't always preach every Sunday uh, because there were other people to preach at the town church in Wittenberg. But uh, he he's he's aware that the Holy Spirit's going to be using the law in different ways, and so he's he's doing what he thinks he's got to do at this point. Thank you for that clarification. So uh, we'll get into now, if Luther was not using the word use, um, yet how come Lutherans are so used to using <laughs> the word use? <laughs> Where you know, And this is why you titled your article uh, Wittenberg or Wittenberg Theology. Um, where does it pop up? And how was... How do the people come up with the term use? How do they mean it to be employed? Well, one of the first real theological crises within the Lutheran movement or the Wittenberg circle of, of friends and, and reformers uh, was the challenge of uh, one of the brightest and best of Luther's students, um, a man named Johanna Gricola in the late 1520s, mid, mid to late 1520s, and then into the 1530s. And Agricola got the message, uh, the use of the law in the Middle Ages was bad. And he came up with a solution, Christians don't need to hear the law anymore. Now, he didn't mean by that they can do anything they want. He had a very strong sense of, of new obedience, but he called it the gospel. In other words, he, he led to, his, his views led to confusion. Um, about the distinction of law and gospel. And Luther saw that as the heart of the message of God for his people. And, and the confusion of law and gospel was precisely what had, had driven him to despair. And so uh, he and, and Philip Melanchthon reacted uh, pretty strongly. And Melanchthon in 1528 in his visitation articles said, 
um, we have to call people to repentance. We have to do that. We have to tell them what what is right and what is wrong, because so much of the of the instruction on the Christian life in the Middle Ages had uh, focused on doing the right religious things, going on pilgrimages, uh, giving alms, and so forth, instead of um, uh, instead of on being a good parent and spouse, being a good shoemaker or, or uh, physician, whatever, and um, and so uh, Agricola, I think he probably wasn't as smart as as Luther and Melanchthon thought he was, um, and probably wasn't ill willed, although some personal rivalries may have played into the controversy. Um, but uh, how are we going to make it clear that um, the law needs to be um, taught, preached, and how are we going to make it clear that uh, that it instructs uh, as well as calls to repentance and brings order to society? And so uh, in the mid-1530s, uh, in reaction to Agricola's challenge to um, the way he and Luther understood the distinction of law and gospel, uh, Melanchthon taught that there are these three uses, and that all three of the uses still have their place in uh, bringing the Word of God to a Christian congregation, because we are in this battle between sin and uh, righteousness that Paul describes in Romans 7, and that Luther describes with his phrase, righteous and sinful at the same time. Uh, and so um, Melanchthon was, was the pedagogue. He was the one who who was organizing biblical materials uh, to teach the people. And, and so Melanchthon said, well, Luther and I are, uh, are still trying to make people in Wittenberg behave. Um, and so we're using this political or societal use of the law. And we're certainly calling them to repentance. And uh, Melanchthon was the one who said the law always accuses. And, uh, and then in addition, uh, we are showing those who want to obey God how to obey God, what the will of God is for our lives. Um, but M Melanchthon, too, I think, had this sense that the law is the law, and um, and the different ways we use it uh, do not determine how the Holy Spirit's going to make it function in the in the ears and minds of our hearers. Um, so. Uh, Luther and Melanchthon are often um, played off against each other, but I don't think in their actual presentation of uh, law or of, of law and gospel, um, there's much difference at all. And they never noticed, they never got into any public disputes about it. And uh, uh, so I, I, I think they were quite in harmony on this point. Yeah, I suppose you would think that working and living with each other, if they had totally different meanings uh, or, or, or definitions that would have come up. Okay. Well, if, if that's the case, uh, why have some in the in the past and down to this day sought to really distance Luther from Melanchthon on, on this issue? Um, I think it's because uh, we have had to deal in North America with this strong pietist tradition that um, that sometimes, not always by any means, but sometimes caused Christians to um, to look to their own works and their own new obedience to measure how sure they could be of their salvation. And uh, so the, the concern that instead of uh, directing us to the cross of Christ, when we ask, who are we, um, the third use of the law had served to direct us toward evaluating our, our relationship with God on the basis of our works. Um, but also a factor was that in in Europe, uh, the the towering figure in, in Protestant Christianity in the um, 1920s already, 30s, uh, 40s, 50s, into the 60s, was a Reformed theologian, uh, Karl Barth, who uh, taught at Basel. And he, as a Calvinist, emphasized the third use of the law. And really said, um, the gospel is, is of course necessary. Uh, first use of the law, or second use of the law, that that's fine. Um, the gospel is there, but but where we really need to focus is on our obedience uh, 
because of the third use of the law. And, and uh, Lutherans like um, Werner Ehlert said uh, no, and they looked at the texts and said Luther didn't talk about a third use of the law, uh, which was literally correct. Um, and, and so they said uh, we ought to talk about the fruits of faith. So that uh, Werner Ehlert, for instance, wrote a book on the Christian ethos, um, which describes the Christian life. Um, but he sees that as the, the, the fruit of faith, um, that which which flows from our trusting um, in God and trusting his absolution that we really are righteous people. And of course, Luther uses that language too. So um, So there's a basis for that argument. But I think the way the argument uh, was pursued uh, uh, is not always helpful. And so we, we need to look to the needs of our people. And today, certainly, the society is not giving them good moral instruction, and they need it. But we also need to realize, particularly as as um, as Zalesorg or as, as pastor, those giving spiritual care to other Christians, we need to recognize that the law is always going to creep back in and accuse. And the 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 more strongly your faith wants to produce the the fruits that are appropriate, because God has forgiven you and, and made you a new creature in Christ. Uh, the more likely it is that you're going to recognize your own sinfulness. So yeah, Paul's there's... struggle in Romans seven goes on for all of us throughout life, and we can only say thanks be to God. For Jesus Christ, our Savior. Yeah, I guess the point is you never want to get to the point where you feel comfortable turning your back on on Christ, no matter what. Yeah, law, you know, law, gospel, whatever use you know you encounter, don't ever think you <laughs> you need it. You can you don't need the training wheels. You don't need to be holding his hand or whatever illustration, yeah. right? Yeah, I think that's. I think hopefully that's that's understood but this is certainly a, a timeless topic though because it, yes <laughs> it's yeah. it, you know 500 years from now if, if this is still around we're still around here you know people can listen to this and probably you know if they understand our, our language we'll understand at least the theological <laughs> you know issue right uh yeah yes. yeah absolutely um so i going back though to to those trying to you know and maybe it's easier to say well melanchthon messed up but luther had it right in a certain degree um that's kind of i've read at least something like that is this all also part of a an endeavor to make the law a little more palatable you know it it, it sounds a little a little harsh if we call it you know fruits of, of faith or, or or turn into another kind of gospel imperative or whatever way you want to rephrase it yeah that there again i think whatever we call it it's still going to do the same thing uh, right it's it's going to be there as as god's plan for our lives and we're going to find that um we don't live up to it uh, but we are going to find especially in a society uh, that that doesn't provide us with moral guidance in, in any meaningful way um we are going to find that uh we simply need to to be looking at the law for what the law is designed to do, and it's designed to to reveal God's design for human life. And uh, we then find that we're not living up to it, and we need to flee to the cross of Christ. Um, and that 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 circle of daily repentance and a return to the cross and the empty tomb is simply a part of the biblical way of looking at life. Yeah, and I think you tie that in towards the end of your article with the the simul justus epicator, you know, point. It's mm -hmm. it, it's both. <laughs> yeah, so you, you need it all. You need it all. You yes. don't don't divide and conquer. Um, even yeah. you know, don't divide law, gospel. Don't divide justification, sanctification. You have to understand yeah. the distinctiveness of them, but don't try to brush one off to the side or divide the law into three parts and just cut one out. And I'll put that over here, and I'll just you know. Yeah. pretend this is the only one right yeah yeah that doesn't work yeah all right well i think we're coming to an end of our, our time for this morning uh and i i got or this afternoon i should say but i think we've got through uh, most of the things i wanted to talk about um before my, my final question or two uh, anything anything that i missed uh, for discussion that you wanted to share on the, the content of our our talk i i 
think that at the end of the article, I mentioned something that I'm still um, want to explore because I've just barely begun to explore it. But in one passage, Luther talks about um, uh, three things that the gospel does. So I think this use of the gospel as a, a recreative word, the a word that forgives our sins and restores us to righteousness. And then secondly, we use it to console those who have been restored to righteousness in the midst of all the struggles of this earth. And then thirdly, it's it's the Holy Spirit's means of empowering our Christian life. I think there might be something there to think through use and function and impact. Uh, but I haven't read Luther texts with that in mind sufficiently to uh, to kind of develop the argument that I had in in this Lutheran Quarterly article, at least on on the uses, functions, and impacts of the law. All right. So that, those are some areas of further study and uh, and discussion for the future. Hey, I'm only 82 years old. I, yeah. I haven't had all that much time to learn. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, with that being said, are, are there any other uh, topics or subjects uh, within the broader realm of Lutheran history that you, you have been working on? Uh, that you care to share today? I, just this week, I'm I'm writing an article uh, for a collected uh, a volume of collected essays on the relationship of the creeds and scripture, and I'm trying to find out where the term ecumenical creeds comes from, and mm-hmm. I think it's a term that the Lutherans invented probably in the not sure 1530s, 40s, 50s. Uh, I know Nicholas Selnecker was actually lecturing on the ecumenical creeds. Um, uh, by the 1560s or 70s. Uh, so somewhere in there, uh, Lutherans, in the search for a kind of secondary authority, a norma normata, as the theologians call it, uh, uh, determined that the apostles, the Nicene and the Athanasian creeds would would be those kinds of public standards uh, along with the rest of the Lutheran confessions by the time we get to the year 1600 or 1580. Um, so that that's one of the, the little detective uh, ventures that I'm involved in uh, as I visit our library this week. Yeah. All right. Well, very good. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kolb, for joining us today to talk about this uh, timely topic of timely, timeless topic, I should say, of Lutheran history and the Christian faith. Thank you, Ben. It was it was uh, great fun. <laughs>